Well, I want to give you a very warm welcome to our service this morning. And it certainly does feel a little bit cooler this morning, doesn't it? Uh, we're definitely coming into the, I don't know about the autumn, but it near feels like the winter, doesn't it? But uh, yeah, it's lovely and warm in here, isn't it? Um, enjoy the warmth, warmth of the fellowship together. You know, as we see this situation in our world at present, um, just with all this developing in the news, it does make us long for our Savior and the new creation that he will ultimately usher in. But this longing is, is not a new thing. It's something that actually even Paul wrote of as well. He wrote how the very creation longs for it. In Romans 8, verses 18 to 25, we read these words. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And now not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now, Hope that is seen is not hope, but for, for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We know we have a blessed hope in the Lord Jesus. It's a hope that doesn't disappoint. It's a hope that is sure. And we have this confidence because of Christ, the one who suffered for us, the one who will come again, and that he will come as Lord of all. And so let's remind ourselves of these glorious truths as we sing this hymn together. You're the word of God the Father from before the earth began. And we'll stand as we sing this together, please. Let's pray together and we'll continue to remember this situation unfolding in the world around us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you do indeed rule over all. And before this world was even made, Lord, you were there. Lord, that by your mighty hand you fashioned this world. And Lord, you put every star in place. 
And that, Father, all creation even holds together by your hand. Lord, we give thanks that you sent your Son and that he is indeed Lord of all. This hymn has reminded us of your great love and how you sent him to, to seek and to save the lost. And Father, Lord, the state of our world this, at this moment reminds us of how badly this world needs to know of your love. How badly they need to know of the peace that you alone can give. Lord, we do continue to pray for the land of Israel and for the ongoing conflict uh, with Palestine. Lord, we pray that Hamas will be defeated. And Lord, we pray for all those families on both sides affected by this terrible conflict. But Lord, we don't just also pray for the governments in the Middle East, but we also pray for the governments in the UK and even further afield as well, as these demonstrations are also going on and as Jews throughout the world also are being intimidated. Lord, we pray for your protection upon them. And Lord, we pray that you would grant wisdom to the various governments, even in how they seek to respond to this on these unfolding developments. And Lord, we pray that we ourselves would also have wisdom, uh, as others even ask us about our, our reaction of these things. But Lord, it does make us long for the day of Christ's return. It reminds us of the state uh, of this broken world that we're living in even the depths of depravity in this broken world. But Father, as uh, Paul has reminded us in Romans 8, there will be a day when all things will be made new. And so, Father, while we yearn for that, we look forward to it even with, with hope as well. We know that the day of well, your son's return, Lord, there will be even come a day when all war will cease, a day when weapons will be laid down, a day, Lord, even when we will receive even the full fruits of our redemption, we want to give you thanks for that, for the sure promises of your word. And Lord, in this, we have hope. We have hope because our Savior is ever living. And so, Lord, encourage us with that knowledge in these difficult days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, um, just let me few, mention a few brief announcements. Um, so as you'll have already seen on the screen as well, and the little announcement slides. So tomorrow morning from 10.30, the ladies from Make and Do are running a, a coffee morning for Macmillan Cancer Support. Uh, you remember uh, we had one of these last year as well, and it was really well attended. And we'd love to see this as well attended as well too. So we would encourage you to come along, and you can come along from 10.30 to 12.30. Um, Any time sort of during that uh, as well. Uh, although probably better to come earlier if you can, you know, just because otherwise, well, I can't promise to be more. I'm quite fond of cake, you know. So uh, so do try and be there if you can from, from 10.30 onwards. Uh, so the ladies from Make and Do are organizing that this year, and we do want to thank them for that. Uh, but do pass the word on. Invite your neighbors, uh, invite your friends, invite your family along. It would be great to see you. And also, as we mentioned uh, last week, the ladies have been knitting teddies for Laura Murray's mission trip in Lebanon. We had some of the photos of the teddies and also, I stand correct as well, bunnies as well too, uh, for Lebanon. But due to the current situation in, in Israel, the missions agency, though, have decided to postpone the trip until May uh, as well. I think the, par- the parcels were still being organized, weren't they, to be going out as well, though, too. Um, but uh, Laura's mission trip, they won't be going out themselves until May now just because of the current situation and developments in Israel as things are still changing rapidly there so do pray for that organization as well and for Laura and also um, just one more thing Um, we'd mentioned before about there's going to be a a prayer praise and promises night on a Thursday night on zoom with Baptist women now if the ladies would like to attend that virtually we can put it on zoom in the in the back room after kids club on Thursday night but if that's something you'd like us to do we need you just need to let us know okay so because we'll not put it on unless there's uh, enough people interested on that so this is this Thursday prayer praise and promises and uh, it's it's free to uh, I think to, to come up to get, uh, to, to get that and to go to that as well too. Um, so do let us know, ladies, about that as well. And these are all the announcements. So let's sing together once again. And it's a wonderful thing to be reminded that we can come before the throne of grace in prayer and that we have a faithful God, one who keeps his promises. And that's what our next hymn uh, reminds us. Lord, I come before your throne of grace. What a faithful God have I. Just stay seated as we sing this together, please. <laughs>
Well, we're turning in our Bibles to the book of Genesis. We're doing a series in the book of Genesis. And as I say, we're going to maybe go up to just uh, before the life of Abraham. So another few weeks um, just left in this series. And uh, last week we saw, and we're in Genesis 8 today. So last week we saw how God's judgment came upon earth because of the son of man. And he sent the flood. And there was one man in his family who found grace in the eyes of God. And that was Noah. So Noah and his family, along with uh, some of the animals, found refuge in the ark, the way of salvation that God had provided. Uh, but we last left Noah on the ark while the flood was still in progress. So um, we're looking at what happens next after the flood in Genesis chapter 8. And we're going to look at the whole chapter today. And it says, But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind blow over the ark, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed, and the rain from the heavens was restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the end of the seventh month, and the seventeenth day in the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the tenth month, in the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of the forty days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up upon, from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from them to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot. And she returned to him, returned him to the ark for the waters were, were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So no one knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him any more. In the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the ark. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, in the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps in the earth, that they may swarm in the earth and be fruitful and multiply. So Noah went out and his sons and his son's wife and his son's wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and every bird, everything that moves in the earth went out by families from the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever strike again, ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And we know that the Lord will bless the reading of his word together. We're going to sing another hymn. Um, just now and Noah was one who found a refuge in God and this hymn is one reminds us a greatly loved him it reminds us of that sure refuge that we have in God amidst all times in life that he is one when we trust in him he will hold us fast and so we'll stand as we sing this together please <laughs> I could 
Well, we're going to pray together, and um, if you do get a copy of the Insight magazine, um, you'll have received a little update in last month's um, the update to the prayer diary. So I'd encourage you to use that even to pray for brothers and sisters in Christ and the other churches as well. So in the little prayer diary today, we're going to remember um, Great Victoria Street, Green Island, uh, Grosvenor Road in Dublin, and Grove, as well as the work of the Amazing Journey with James Robinson, and also Colin and Debbie Jervis in Baptist Missions, who incidentally, they're coming to us next year, God willing. Uh, they've been booked to come along to talk about the work they're doing, Monaghan and Fermanagh. And also Amy and Lydia Kalani in Tacna, and also Clem Hegarty, who's retired. So we're going to be praying for them as well too today. It's a good thing even to, as I say, to use that diary, a little prayer diary, to remember some of the different churches and some of the workers in prayer. But let's pray for them now. We're also going to give thanks to God that um, Edith has been feeling uh, a bit better as well. She was taken into hospital um, just later on on Friday evening. And, um, but um, with, she was taking them a breathing difficulties, but they've managed to regulate things there now. So um, uh, their family tell me she's hoping to get out today. So do give thanks to God for that. But let's continue to pray for her as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, for the great truths that we've just sung, Lord, that you do indeed hold us fast. That in the midst of the, the many things that we face in this life, we give thanks that your presence with us is constant. And Lord, as is your care, even when we sleep, Lord, Psalm 121 reminds us, Lord, even you watch over us. You are our keeper, and we want to thank you. Lord, we give you thanks even for just how you've managed to strengthen um, Edith. And Lord, we do pray for her, and we pray for the family as they continue to look after and to care for her. And Father, we do pray for other members of our church who are housebound at present. Lord, may they be um, encouraged, Lord, even as they watch the services online or even as they are visited as well too. We do pray that that will be just a help and encouragement for them. Father, we do want to give you thanks even for the partnership and the gospel also that we can have with our brothers and sisters in Christ and how this was expressed even over the summer uh, with um, as we partnered and worked with the churches in Dundonald and also Newton Ards as well. And we do pray our brothers and sisters will be encouraged there. And Lord, we want to thank you for our association of churches. We do pray for Steve Auld and Simon Farwell in, in Great Victoria Street and for uh, Michael Wiley and um, Phil High in Green Island and also for Ed Neal and the team at Grosvenor Road. Lord, we pray for them as they minister in their respective areas. Lord, encourage them with fruit for their labor. Lord, help them as they seek to reach out into their community and as they, like ourselves, try and build meaningful relationships even with others for your glory. Lord, we also pray for the church in Grove. Lord, build them up and guide them. Lord, we give thanks for their faithful witness over the years. And we pray, Lord, that you'll continue to preserve that witness as well too. And Lord, we also thank you for the work of the amazing journey and the work that they're doing in the schools. Uh, we give thanks, Lord, even just for the many opportunities that James has had already this year. And even for the recent opportunity with Malayal Baptist. Um, Lord, we ask that they, they it would be the means of even them reaching other uh, children as well too. And Father, we also pray for Colin and Debbie as they seek to plant a church in uh, Monaghan and Fermanagh. Uh, Lord, just help them and for Amy and Lydia Kalani and Tacna as well. Lord, we also pray for Clem Hegarty and for his faithful ministry. Lord, encourage him in his retirement as well. And Lord, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, that as we look, Lord, even today at your steadfast love and as we think of your steadfast love to the association, to even to us as a church, to us as individuals, we give thanks for evidence of this steadfast love even in the life of Noah. And so, Lord, may that encourage us. Lord, just as we consider your truth, Lord, draw us closer to you and may we have a closer walk with God. Help us today. and Speak through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So please turn to Genesis 8 once again, please. Genesis 8. And we, we join Noah and his family. They're on the ark, uh, along with all the animals. And the rains and the, uh, the, the floods from the waters and the depths had stopped, as we're going to see. And it had rained for 40 days and 40 nights. The waters had, had arisen even to, to depths that were 
unimaginable. It must have been so unimaginable what this must have been like. It covered even the very mountains. Even the very highest mountain was covered over 20 feet um, as well. 20 feet allowing the ark even to pass over it as well. So we read at the end of the previous chapter that the, the waters prevailed, it says, for 150 days. But all of this is going to change with just two words. And those two words are at the beginning of our chapter. But God. Someone once said, I was trying to recollect who it was, about how these are some of the most precious words in Scripture. But God. Because we find them again in Ephesians when we talk about, um, when Paul talks about uh, our sin. And then it says, but God is rich in mercy. We find this precious expression. And this is what's going to change everything here because God takes the initiative in saving this family and what follows at first glance this may may seem maybe even a little bit puzzling because it says God remembered them God remembered them the Lord remembers and renews see God remembers knowing all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the in the ark now when it says God remembered Noah it's not meaning that with all the flood going on that the Lord somehow forgot about the ark That's not what it's meaning. It didn't mean he forgot about Noah or forgot about his family. But actually we find this expression, God, uh, the Lord remembered a number of times in Scripture, and in the Old Testament particularly. And every time you read it, it's really significant little phrase because every time you read it, it comes before God taking some, um, often initiating some action, often miraculous action as well to save his people. So you find many instances of this. In Genesis 19, for example, God remembers his covenant and with Abraham and he saves Lot. We also find it again when the Lord remembers Rachel and gives her a child in Genesis 30. More famously, we can think of it in Exodus 2, whenever it says God remembered his people. He hadn't forgotten his people were in Egypt. But whenever we find that expression, it was the Lord remembered his covenant And the Lord was about to take action on behalf of his people. And this is exactly what was happening here. This was going to be a a movement of God was going to take place. Noah remembers, God remembers Noah, his family and the animals in the midst of all this scene of destruction. You know, we have seen floods, but we've never seen a flood anything like this. Can you imagine looking and all you see around is water? Maybe if you've been on the boat and you've been out in the midst of the sea, you maybe get a a bit of a glimpse of this. But knowing that the whole earth is covered. You know, but what a comfort this is. In the midst of this scene, God remembers his people. He doesn't forget them. And you know, maybe there's times in your life where you feel alone. Maybe times where you feel maybe no one knows what you're going through. Maybe, you know, you have your own burdens and concerns. And you're reluctant even maybe to share those with others. But God knows. He knows all things. And what a comfort that gives us. What a comfort that gives us. To know that God always remembers his people. Even when we shed a tear, even in private as well too. The Lord sees that. The Lord knows. And the Lord cares. I wonder how Noah felt during that time. 150 days. Being out in that ark. I'm sure there was times maybe where he maybe did feel maybe even alone as well. But the Lord had not forgotten him. God knows. Even troubled hearts as well. And the Lord is, even when we go through the painful circumstance, the Lord is with us right in the midst of our pain. See, God hadn't forgotten Noah and he hasn't forgotten any of us as well. Notice here God's care and protection. It doesn't just extend to the human beings, even in verse 1. It also extends to the animal, because he remembered the beasts and the livestock, even that were with him in the ark. The Lord remembered them as well too. So God makes a wind blow over the ark, and the waters begin to subside. Now through this chapter, there's many echoes again of Genesis 1 here, because the same word used for wind, the same Hebrew word, is the same word that's used even to speak of the Spirit in in Genesis chapter 1 that moved over the waters at the beginning. And then in Genesis 1, the the wind moved over the, the waters, actually separating the waters from the dry land. And maybe Moses is deliberately alluding to that here, you know, showing here that this is a new creation that's about to take place. God's using this wind to return the earth to the state that it had even once before. 
But notice there's something that was else that was taking place. Verses 2 to 4. The waters that had burst up from the depths. <clears throat> now we talked about this last week. But there was waters that came up. It didn't just come down. When we think of the flood we think it just came down as rain. But it says actually waters burst from the depths. Maybe like the subterranean depths of, you know, the, when we think of the sea, you know, we don't, often don't appreciate how deep it actually is. Um, there's a place uh, called the Mariana Trench. I've just, it's just come into my mind. If you ask me where that is, I'll tell you when I look up Google on my phone later. But um, it's just come into my mind. But I know it's one of the deepest depths of the sea, the Mariana Trench. They haven't actually explored, been able to explore the complete depths of this. So there is depths of water, even today. But these depths even burst. They burst up as well. So the water wasn't just coming down. What was it the old chorus used to sing when you were in Sunday school? The rains came down, the floods went up. So that's what happened. The floods were coming up as well. But it says they stopped. The, the waters that burst from the depths, the fountain of the deep, had closed. The rain from the heavens then was restrained. And uh, whereas before, the thing that strikes you about Genesis 7 is it talks about the waters prevailed. They prevailed. They prevailed on the earth. Whereas here, they're restrained. And here, the, while there was 150 days when the waters were over the earth, and the 40 days and 40 nights were likely part of that. But there's going to be another 150 days where the waters recede. So 150 days where there was, uh, the floods were on the earth. The flood was on the earth. So 40 days, 40 nights. And then the waters was there for that period. But then there's 150 days where the water is going to also recede as well. But as at this point, I want to maybe take a brief diversion. I don't often do this in a sermon, but I'm going to take a wee detour this morning, okay? And this is because I was asked a wee question last night. It was a really good question at the door. And as I said, if there's any questions about Genesis do come to me. I can't promise always to be able to answer them, but I will look into them as well too. And if I can't answer them, I'll maybe get someone else along who can. But one question was asked, with this time period on the ark, so it was 150 days when the waters were prevailing on the earth, 150 days when it abated, how did Noah have enough food for the animals uh, to be all right? How, How would the food not spoil You know, it is a really good question. And it's something that actually I think it's important for us to hit the pause button here and consider. Because sometimes people who aren't Christians, you know, turn around to us and ask us things like this, don't they? They ask us things like, how can you believe in the ark? You know, I've I've dealt with some of these objections previously. Like, for example, when we talked about, we even mentioned about, you know, people will turn around and say, how can they fit all the animals in? What about the dinosaurs? But, you know, many of the dinosaurs, you know, were actually quite small as well too. But also, big dinosaurs were once little as well. They forget that, you know. And also, you know, here's the thing. When they were on the ark for this period, I did defeat them. So how could they have survived on the ark all this time? Now, what we have here is actually a picture of a thing called the ark encounter in Kentucky. Um not KFC, Kentucky. Actually, Kentucky the place is the Ark Encounter. And just to give you an idea, it is apparently ball built to scale. And on this is an exhibition you can all walk around. Um, I'm not sure the church trip that's going to be coming up just soon or anything like that, but it's Kentucky. But if you notice down here, you can just about maybe see there's two people actually standing outside it. This gives you an idea of the scale of the Ark compared to these two people. If you haven't gone to Specsavers, there they are down there. But there, there were, there were, this was the size of it, the, the ark compared to the size of the people. So when people talk about a boat, I mean, they're thinking of something like the size of, I don't know, a, a cruise ship, or they're thinking about something the size of maybe your, your Stella Sea Link or whatever. But the ark was vast. The ark was vast. That's the thing they need to bear in mind. It wasn't just, you know, uh, a, small, a small boat. And they have the measurements here. We, we see that. Now, <clears throat> so how could Noah have survived all this time? As I say, remember, he could have taken some of the younger animals onto the ark. And not all those dinosaurs even, many of the dinosaurs actually even were, you know, small as well. Yes, there were larger ones like the T-Rexes and so on as well too. But remember, the accommodation was actually spacious as well too. This was actually large accommodation um, as well too. Also remember, 
Remember some of the larger animals, right? Talking about elephants, if, if they're on, say, an ark for that time, you know, an elephant obviously is going to grow during that time if they do take a small elephant. You know, how could they have accommodated them? Here's the thing, and this was a thing I hadn't thought about. Answers in Genesis point this out. This is coming from Answers in Genesis, not me, by the way. But they were saying, remember how often animals under stress actually do prefer more cramped conditions, actually. We kind of think they need a, a big, vast cage, like, you know, Bellevue or, you know, ever, the zoo up there, whatever it's called. You know, but actually often, in, amongst stressful situations, often they do actually seek out more cramped accommodations and little nests as well. Cages would actually make some of them feel more secure. So no doubt also there were areas in the ark where animals could move around too. And this is answers in Genesis again. They have done the miles and tried to work it all out. And they have uh, worked out the spaces. Remember there's three levels in the ark as well too. So the spaces for family um, uh, living as well too. You know, spaces for bird cages. Spaces for large animal pens um, as well too. And as I say, given the vastness of this, there would have been space even areas even where they could have walked around if they were kept in pens you know no doubt maybe there was a a routine maybe no one the sun's had you know maybe it's time to let the elephants out for you know for a bit of a a bit of a walk there would have been space like that this ark encounter actually when you look at it online you can actually get a little bit of a tour on it to give you an idea of the vastness they hold a whole exhibition of this you know, as well. And there's plenty of room and space for people to, to walk around. But what about the, the food situation? As I say, great question. And the thing is, Noah had to feed himself, his family, and to feed the animals as well. Um, they could have preserved fruits as well, and, and honey, and jams, and jellies, and syrups. Also, certain uh, things like gur- uh, gourds could maintain fresh for up to a year, actually, believe it or not, as well. They could have also had dried fruits as well. You can buy dried fruits, which last for ages, you know, in the shops today, and they could have done that. Remember, Noah had a long time to prepare for this. He wasn't just preparing the ark. I don't doubt they were actually preparing even the food as well for that. They could have even provided, um, you know, even dried vegetation as well and made up, like, uh, feed and pellets as well for the animals too. Um, they could have even, it's possible they could have grown some food as they lived in the ark. Now, there was limited, a uh, little caveat here, there was, of course, limited light, of course, in the ark. But there was uh, some of the, the, the little designs and structures of the ark, you know, do sort of talk about even windows that would run along the side. So there could have been some light as well. So they could have potentially grown some things um, in the ark as well. The animals could have had dried vegetation. And, and what are those animals who were meat eaters? Well, it's possible they could have also stored live animals on board as well too. Um, apologies to anyone who ever had one of these pets. So this is, that's the caveat, okay? Apparently sailors in the 1600s and 1700s used to bring fresh giant tortoises on board ships as a fresh meat source. Apparently that was a thing. Boy, I'm thankful that's not in the menu of the Stennis Sea Link any longer. But... Um, why? Because tortoises, you see, were hardy animals. And actually, apparently, a tortoise can survive over a year without food. It's amazing sometimes where your sermon research takes you, and that's where mine took me this week. Um, also, other meats can be preserved through driving, uh, driving, drying, pickling, salting, or smoking as well, too. Also, some meat-eating animals might have had to switch to a plant-based diet whenever meat wasn't available. Insects could even be bread and fruit, grains, And a manure as well, something we wouldn't have a shortage of in the ark for a year. But what about the other question? Some people here are thinking about this, and if you've had your coffee and your Weetabacks this morning, you may be saying, that's the food. What about the water? Well, it could have been stored even, this is one of the answers in Genesis ones that they suggest, there could have been large cisterns of water as well, even stored. There also could have been parts where they've collected and uh, filtered water, and how could they have filtered water? There's apparently also um, little, uh, things like mussels, organisms, could actually filter out water as well too. They would have had to obviously clean those tanks as well. But there is also things that can naturally filter water as well too. 
So this is just some of the explanations. You can look at all this stuff online. Um, so this is the, where they're collecting some of the rainwater and then this big cistern um, as well too. So there are many more questions you have regarding this and feel free to ask them. As I say, I may not always know the answer, but I can look into it. Um, but I do think it's important to look at this because it is something that you, pro- you might get asked some people because some people just look at the book of Genesis and laugh. They say, how could there be a flood? How could there be like this? You can point out that there is other accounts also that even outside of scripture that also talk about a flood as well. But there was 150 days when the waters prevailed. Let's come back from where we detour now. There was 150 days when the waters began to subside. And then on the seventh month, on the, on the 17th day of that month, we're told, um, so that, that's verse 4, we're told that the ark comes to rest on Mount Ararat. And sorry, the mountains of Ararat. And notice it was a specific day given, once more reminding us this is an actual event. Most people speak of the ark coming to rest on Mount Ararat, but actually it says it came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. It was one of the mountains on Ararat. It doesn't say which particular mountain there was. And where is Ararat? It's among the, um, really the, the modern region of Armenia, which is near the border of Turkey, Russia, and Iran. But the timing of this, though, is interesting. The seventh month. What happens in the seventh month? That was the Jewish uh, calendar. And the Jewish calendar was Tishri. And that month would be the Day of Atonement as well as the day of um, of the uh, the Feast of Trumpets and Tabernacles. So isn't it appropriate the Ark finds rest on the day when it would later be used to celebrate atonement and God's provision? It's interesting that, isn't it? The timing of it when the ark finds rest. But as you look at it, the waters begin to subside. And it's five months really since the floods began when the ark comes to rest in the mountains. But it's going to be a slow, gradual process as the waters go down. It's not until the 10th month that they begin to see the tops of the rest of the mountains. One commentator remarks, I wonder what the feeling on the ark was like. Because I wonder if you ever gone for a flight somewhere. Have you ever had this experience? You go on a flight somewhere, you've maybe traveled for so many hours in the plane and you finally make it. You touch down and you're waiting to you know, get in and get off the plane and then you hear the announcement that comes on to say, unfortunately we're having some difficulties currently trying to get uh, just a place. We're waiting for directions you know, from the tower as to where to go and you're left on the plane for 10, another 10, 15 minutes. Have you ever had that experience? I've had and you're sitting on, you're going, five or ten minutes, I've travelled all that distance. Look, what am I doing now? I'm stuck in a plane on a runway. What am I doing? And sometimes we get frustrated like that, and it's only like 15 minutes. Consider them. They were on the ark. They'd come to rest, and they must have been thinking to themselves, when's this going to go down here? You know, the waters were covering the earth, and it was going to take time. It was going to take time. You know, I wonder, was any of Noah's family ever becoming irritated or wondering, when are we going to get out here? They must have been eager to get out. But of course, they couldn't leave the ark at that moment. There was no place for them that did just come to rest. But it's not like they could just go for a walk somewhere. The waters were still prevailing on the earth. So you see, the issue was they had to wait on the Lord. Oh, there we go. Waiting on the Lord as the tops of the mountains emerge. It says then, Noah, what he does was open the window of the ark and he sends forth a raven. Now, again, why a raven? These are questions I ask myself sometimes because is it because some say, is it because a raven was an unclean animal? Is that why he sent that out? But actually, I don't think that's right um, because when you look into ra- uh, ravens, and ravens apparently are, are excellent and really acrobatic flowers. They're also really intelligent birds. But there's something else about that made a raven a good choice for him to send out. A raven, you see, is a scavenger. A raven actually can feed on uh, carrion. And what is carrion? It's just a nice word for basically saying dead meat, actually. So consider how, you know, with the flood, there would have been the animals would have even floated. Uh, sorry, just, I know this is a bit of a gruesome place to take you on a Sunday morning, but I'm trying to think of the reality here. The raven went out, and as the raven would have been able to actually to feed on actually even carrying the, the, the animals that would have been lying there as well. It didn't return. Uh, it, it, we're not told it returned to Noah. Did it survive? 
Actually, yes, I think I did. Why do I think that? Because don't have ravens today. These are unclean animals. And remember, of the unclean animals, there was only one pair, really, of them, male and female. So actually, that raven would have had to have been able to survive on the carrion. And then as the other one was set free later, you know, there we go, we have ravens today. So it does explain that. You know, so here the raven was, was sent out. It would have had food. Also, presumably a week later, Noah sends out another bird. This one, uh, a dove. A dove is sent out. A dove is an animal that would eat seeds and insects. So it's interesting that he sends this one out. A dove wouldn't have fed on the carrion. They needed to actually find seed and other insects as well. So this is a good choice for Noah to send out because this is one that's going to actually uh, only be able to feed if the water had gone down enough. Uh, the other animal would have been able to feed. You know, anywhere really he went, he would, have, he would have been fussy. It was a scavenger. But the dove, well, he didn't find anywhere to rest, so he came back. And so in verse 10, he waits another seven days and sends out the dove again. This time the dove comes back with an olive branch. Now, what did that tell Noah? Uh, olive trees, you see, grew in lower-lying areas. So uh, Noah would have known that this is the water going down further in the lower-lying areas. And also it would have shown to him, well, this is, would obviously be a new plant as well, was beginning to grow. You know, and even today, the symbol of the dove with the olive branch is a symbol of peace today, isn't it? But here, I suppose in many ways, it's a symbol of life, actually, here. Isn't it for Noah? But look at verse 12. Again, a further week he waits and the dove is sent out again. Only now it doesn't return. Why? Because it's found a home. So in the 600th and first year, we're told, of Noah's life, remember the flood started in the 600th year of his life. So think about it. It actually happened on the first day of Noah's 601st year. It was actually on his birthday. On Noah's birthday is when actually you know, they're able to they find land. They are, the waters have subsided sufficiently. What a, what a birthday present that must have been. Yeah. But even Noah, uh, God, Noah, Noah doesn't uh, leave the ark until God tells him to. Notice that he, whenever that animal didn't come back, he could have thought, well, there we go, that's it. Let's go, come on. But he didn't. He waited on the Lord. Do you know, it's not easy waiting on the Lord at times. Maybe sometimes we have been praying about something for maybe, maybe months, maybe years, maybe even decades as well. You've been praying about something and you're waiting to see that answer. Or maybe you're waiting to see a circumstance in your life that maybe will, will end. You know, but yet the Lord brought his people through it. They waited on the Lord. They didn't try and rush ahead of God's time. And so Noah didn't leave the ark until God told them. Verses 14 to 15. Here we see how God commands them to leave. Near the end of the second month, the, ark had sufficiently, uh, the earth had dried out. And so Noah, the Lord tells Noah to leave along with his family and the animals. And notice the instruction given in verse 17. Every living thing, birds, animals, and every creeping thing, that they may swarm in the earth, be fruitful, and multiply. Can you hear echoes of Genesis 1 there, Genesis 2 again? that they be fruitful and multiply. This is a beginning, a new beginning, a fresh beginning. Here Noah is stepping out in many ways to the new, a new world. Can you imagine the excitement that his family must have felt? Imagine the excitement the animals must have felt being let out of the ark after all that time. This is a new beginning. But I want you to notice carefully Noah's actions. Because here we see Noah's thankfulness and God's promise. Verses 20 to 22. What was the first thing that Noah did? He built an altar when he went out of the, the ark. So not only did God remember Noah, but Noah remembers the Lord and he gives thanks to him. But there's some things that we were told about this offering. Look at verse 20. It's going to be a costly offering. There's going to be every kind of clean animal. It's the one of every kind of clean animal offered. Now remember, there were seven pairs of clean animals taken into the ark. And they offered some of each. And some of every clean bird. Now, think about it. These are now the only animals on the whole earth. But yet, Noah offers some of each of them. This was a costly sacrifice he was offering. 
But notice the type of offering. It was a burnt offering. And when we read about this type of offering in the Bible, this, this didn't just come later when the law was given. This was an offering of thankfulness. But also given how God responds, it's also something of an offering of atonement. See, Noah had been delivered from this great catastrophe. And so here in this offering, he's showing his submission and his dependence on God. A burnt offering also would have been offered when, uh, uh, an offering for sin. You know, when the law was given, they would have offered one even in the morning and evening in, tabern in the tabernacle. But the fact of how God responds, this is a pleasing aroma to him. The Lord smelt the aroma of the sacrifice and it's pleasing. It was acceptable to him. This offering was making atonement. But it reminds us, doesn't it, of a, another more costly sacrifice. One of who Jesus offered in his life. When he gave an offering of atonement. And so it says here, the Lord said, I never again curse the ground because of man. See, the curse wasn't going to be removed. It was still in effect. The Lord was, um, you know, it was still in effect here. It's, it's not that he's not going to send a, he's not going to send a flood that's going to destroy the earth. Yes, with floods and yes, with tsunamis, but, but none of them destroy the earth in a way that, that we have here. The Lord says, I'll never again destroy the earth like this. You know, but he says something else. This is even though the intention of man's heart is evil from their youth, even from birth. You know, we're born with Adam's sinful nature, aren't we? It says each of us is like this by nature. But the Lord says, I never again strike down every living creature as I've done here. Noah submitted himself before the Lord and a burnt offering. It was consumed. It was, a, it was a picture of total giving yourself to God. Something that Noah was doing here. He was effectively saying to the Lord, Lord, it's all yours. You know, how else does the Lord respond? He speaks of restoration and security. Because after the chaos of the flood, there's going to be some stability and rhythms of life restored. Harvests, seasons, day and night for as long as the earth continues. And all of these things are going to come by the gracious hand of God. See how God responds with grace, blessing. And here he's going to respond with covenant. We're going to look at that, God willing, next week. Noah found refuge in God. Atonement was made. And as we come around the table, we're going to remember the way that atonement was made for us. When Jesus offered of himself for us. But how do we respond when we remember that salvation? Are we thankful for it? And are we willing to respond by giving of ourselves? But just as God provided a way of salvation for Noah and his family, he still provides a way for sinners to be saved through Christ Jesus. And so let us respond with thanksgiving. Let's pray together and then we'll sing a hymn. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you, Lord, for this account for how you delivered Noah how you remembered him, how you did not forget Noah. Lord, how you kept your promises to him and how you delivered him in the way that you said you would, Lord. And we give you thanks for the ark, the way of salvation provided. And Lord, we give you thanks for the way of salvation provided in Jesus. Lord, help us as we remember the Savior now in his own appointed way. Lord, help us to be thankful. Help us to respond also in submission as well as we give of ourselves as we give of our lives to you and be glorified in us. In Jesus' name, amen. And as we go to communion, we're going to sing a hymn by Stuart Town. And I don't think it's been sung in quite a while, actually. Uh, so I do hope you remember it. It was on our system as well, too. But uh, So I think it has been sung in the past. No, you see, give thanks for God's grace that he found. And so let us do the same thing as we sing. May the peace of God, our Heavenly Father, and the grace of Christ, our risen Son, and the fellowship of God the Spirit, keep our hearts and minds within his love. This is something of a benediction. And so... Let's sing it together. Let's stand as we sing this hymn, please.
Let's turn to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5. I want to just read one verse from Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 verse 2. Ephesians 5 verse 2. Noah had offered a sacrifice to God, and as he offered it, it was, you see, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But as we gather around the tables, once more we see parallels also with Christ's sacrifice. So let me read Ephesians 5 too. It says, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Paul here is exhorting the readers to, to walk in love, But then the supreme example of of love that he gives them as he's talking about how Christ has loved us and how he was willing to give himself up for us. And notice what Jesus did upon the cross and how it's described, a fragrant offering to God. When Jesus gave of himself, you see, it glorified God. It even pleased the heavenly father. And that might sound shocking to talk about being pleased in in such a, a scene of terrible suffering. Yet Isaiah 53 verse 10 says, it was the will of the Lord that a servant would be crushed and put to grief. It was in the Lord's will that that would happen, that it would be necessary for the suffering servant to suffer. And it says that would be because his soul would make an offering for guilt. This is why such an offering was necessary. You see, when Jesus gave of himself upon the cross, he was fulfilling that great purpose for which he was sent. He was making atonement for our sin. He didn't just bring an offering. He was the offering. He was giving himself, and it was a sacrifice. That's how it's described here, a sacrifice. A sacrifice that so wonderfully revealed the love of God. It revealed how the love of God was so vast. It was perfect. It was a sovereign love. It showed Christ's love for us as well, didn't it? And the fact that he was willing to do that, to go to a cross, that he was obedient even to death. But it also doesn't show the seriousness of our sin, that it would require the death of God's only son, his life, his death, his resurrection. That alone would be the atonement for our sin. You know, Noah's offering may have turned aside God's wrath, for how, but how much more did Christ do that for us? For Jesus was the one who could, only, who could provide an eternally pleasing sacrifice. He alone was the one who God the Father said, you are my beloved son, with you I'm well pleased. It was pleasing to God, a, a fragrant offering, because of what he accomplished in his death. Through his death, that way would be opened, that new and living way to God. And through his death, eternal life would be made possible for many. And But through his death, God would be glorified. And so as Noah responded with thanksgiving, let us respond with thanksgiving now as we come around the table and remember Christ's sacrifice for us. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Our Heavenly Father, as we come around the table this morning, We want to thank you for your great love. And just like Noah, who gave up a thanksgiving offering, we want to do the same this morning. We thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died in our place. We thank you for keeping us from day to day. And we ask you, dear Father, that we might be thankful for your mercy and your grace in our lives. For each day, as we take this bread, we thank you in our Saviour's name.
Again, Father, we thank you for this great privilege of coming around your table and remembering what you've done at the place called Calvary for each one of us. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. And through the shedding of his blood, we have been cleansed from our sin and been brought into your family. So, Father, this morning as we take this cup, which is a tangible reminder of the precious blood that was shed, we give you thanks from redeemed hearts. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the sacrifice that was made for our sins. Lord, we give thanks for what Jesus did for us. And Lord, help us to respond as, as Noah did, but Lord, by willing to give of ourselves to you. Lord, as the one who gave of himself, Lord, did that so self-sacrificially. Lord, help us to walk in love also with one another. May his love be our example, Lord, as well. And Lord, help us as we seek to live our lives for your glory. And Lord, be with us again as we gather in once again tonight, Lord. And Lord, as we consider from your word about how the gospel went forth and how it was received, Lord, may it be an encouragement to, and a help to us as we seek to proclaim your word here in Cumber. So help us, Lord, today. Bless even every time that we may be spent with our, our family or as we head back to our homes, Lord, we we'll enjoy this time even to rest as well. Father, just be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm.